tonight we are going to begin a new series that I am very excited about. And uh, it's one of those things where you can't preach it enough, but you can also preach it incorrectly. So we're going to take our time with it, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit lead as we go through it, because a revolution needs to change. Revolution needs to happen, I should say. Revolution needs to happen in the body of Christ. And like all great revolutions, they happen at home and then they spread outward. And since this is our home, we are all family here, revolution is going to begin here if it doesn't begin anywhere else. And it is financial in nature, but it's not financial in purpose. Um, to be completely honest with you, it's not really a money message. The series really isn't about finances. But for those of you that receive and for those of you that believe, you will see financial change in your life. I speak both from experience and from being taught this. The Holy Spirit is again to teach this to me. Uh, in the near the, we were still in the middle of the marriage series and he, he probably a few, couple months ago I'd say, he said, this is what you're going to, we're going to go there next. We're going to go here next. And I said, okay, you know, I get excited about certain things because I know that certain topics, certain subjects get people excited. Money is one of those things. But you got to ask yourself why. Most of the time it's because you don't have enough or you think you don't have enough. And so any, any word that makes you think you're going to get more money, people get excited about. What I am endeavoring to dispel throughout this series is the idea that one, you don't have enough, and two, that it's about money at all, because it isn't. But we're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about the ways that the kingdom of God interacts with money. We're going to talk about tithing. We're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about sowing. We're going to talk about what, how they're alike and how they're different, because they're not the same. We're going to talk about what to expect from each one. We're going to talk about what not to expect from each one. We're going to talk about how to receive based on each form of giving. Some of these things are things that we've been taught before because we've, we've always emphasized prosperity in this church. Thank God for that. I thank God every day, more now than ever, that prosperity was never frowned upon in this church. I would like to preface this message by saying that, yes, Pastor Diana and myself, we are prosperity preachers. However you want to define that, we don't care. We are what the world calls prosperity preachers. We are not in it for the money. We are not showboating in the name of getting people to give us more money. You don't have to give another dime to either one of us anytime you get ready. You don't take care of us. God takes care of us. What we are are examples just as each and every one of you are and should be and will be, are examples of what prosperity looks like in every area of your life. I watched a, I couldn't get through it because it was so terrible, but I, I, I was curious about what the opposition says about us. You know, to really, un, to, to, to defeat an enemy, you must understand your enemy. So I took my best shot at watching this little documentary about prosperity preachers and how they're so evil. And I couldn't get through it, but about 10 or 15 minutes of it before I was like, oh, okay, we've heard all this before. But there was one thing that the guy said at the beginning that stuck out to me that I've heard many times before. He said, I don't really care about the theology. It just doesn't look right. He said, I don't care if it's the Bible or not. That's not really what my argument is. I'm not even a Christian. So I'll let theologians argue whether this prosperity thing is in the Bible or not. It just doesn't look right. That was his whole, that was the crux of the documentary. It doesn't look right. He played a clip where uh, Joel Osteen was saying how he doesn't take a salary from his church. And Joel Osteen is very rich. He's been criticized a lot for his cars and his home and things like that. And this, have your own opinion based on the word of God. You should. And then you should keep it to yourself, because you never speak against a man of God. But he played the clip 
where Joel Osteen said, I don't take a salary from my church. All the money that comes into Lakewood, I don't take a salary from that. He said, all my money comes from my book sales and things like that. He said, I'm a New York Times bestselling author multiple times over. He said, that's where my wealth is generated. And the guy said, even if that's true, and he's not taking any money from the church, it doesn't look right that a preacher has a Ferrari. And that was his argument, that it doesn't look right. But the, the title of the documentary is how evil it is that preachers have money. And I'm like, well, if it's not illegal, and it's in the Bible, and it, it just doesn't look right to you, that's not the definition of evil. The definition of evil is this is good and this is evil. You don't have any arguments for why it's evil. It just doesn't look right. And then the Lord said, the reason it doesn't look right, he said, it's not that guy's fault. That guy's a sinner. He doesn't have any revelation. The reason it doesn't look right is because it's not enough Joel Osteen's. Exactly. See, when you're a banker and you drive around in a Ferrari, nobody says that doesn't look right. When you're a doctor and you have a Ferrari, nobody says that doesn't look right. You expect them to have Ferraris. People ride up in a Lamborghini or Bentley or a Rolls Royce, and you ask them what they do, and they say, oh, I'm a stock trader, or oh, I'm a lawyer. People go, oh, that makes sense. But if you say I'm a preacher, people go, well, that doesn't look right, because it's not enough of us. So if you have the majority of a people not in Ferraris and a minority in Ferraris, it's easy to hate on the minority. Because it's easy to say, doesn't look right. But if you never met a broke Christian, it would look right. So we are going to begin our series this evening. And the title of this series is going to be Creating a Culture of Prosperity. Creating a Culture of Prosperity. Now, when I began studying this, I didn't know I was studying this. The Lord took me to Proverbs. He said, read the book. You know, when I, when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is read my Bible. I want to know what the Lord has to say to me first thing in the morning. I get up before my wife does, because once she's up, she's very distracted. She consumes my attention if I'm home. That's all right. That's what she's for. So I wake up two hours ahead of her so me and God can have all the time we need, because when she wakes up, I can't stay away from her. That's why she's there. And I don't mind that. And neither does she. Plus, she's going to have a list of things for me to do. She's always getting in the way of my spiritual development. You know, I'm working on her. I'm working on her. So I get up a couple hours ahead of her so that I get the, the couch all to myself. And I got a whole routine, man. I get on the couch. I open the window just enough to get some sunlight because I like to read the sunlight if there's sunlight. And uh, I get my Bible out and I say, all right, Lord, I'm here. Let's talk. What do you want to say to me? Sometimes I'll talk for half an hour before I let him talk. We've, we've had conversations about that. But I spend as much time as I need, but I always go into the word first. It's just good to put the first thing in your eyes should be the word. First thing to go in your eyes before you can look in your phone or turn the TV on or whatever you do, it should be the word. You make that a, a, a habit, it's going to transform you spiritually. You don't need a long, drawn-out ceremony. With crust still in your eyes, crack your Bible open and get to reading. So I'm in the book of Proverbs, and the Lord told me to read it. And as I'm studying it, he begins to give this to me. And he says, we need a culture of prosperity. Now, when you think culture of prosperity, you're immediately thinking, we need a culture where all the Christians have money. Because that's what I thought when I first heard that title. Oh, we're going to talk about money, Lord. He said, yeah, we are, but not really. He said, money is a product. He said, but what I'm really interested in is the culture of prosperity. You see, a prosperous culture is not defined just by money alone, but all the other elements that allow wealth to move freely throughout the culture without restriction. One of the reasons why Kenneth Copeland's and Justice Duplantis's and men and women of God like that get so much flack is because there's a lot of restriction in the church on money. Nobody defends them except people like them. 
but there's two billion people claiming Christianity on the earth. And even if all two billion of them don't have a lot of money, they could keep their mouth shut about the ones that do, but they don't. They go on YouTube and write dirty comments, or they get churches of their own and preach against money, and then they take up offerings. Explain that, you know. Never understood that myself. I'd rather be a millionaire pastor and not take up an offering. Then you couldn't blame me for nothing, but that actually isn't biblical. And we're going to talk about that, too, because the church must give, no matter how much money the church has, because it's a culture. It's not about money. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. This is a well-read, well-known scripture, but we don't know it as well as we think we do. Every time I read it, I get something else out of it. And I'm just going to start reading because it's about 12 verses I want to read. I don't want to take all night. Proverbs chapter 3, this will be your homework as well. Verse 1 through 12, my son, forget not my law. Now, who is writing the book of Proverbs? Solomon is writing the book of Proverbs. What's unique about Solomon is two things. He's famous for two things. He's famous for being extremely wise, and he's famous for being extremely rich. These are the two things that Solomon is most famous for. Being extremely wise, so wise that other rulers of other nations would travel to hear his wisdom, and so rich that other nations would travel to see his money. That is not a coincidence. And when you read the book of Proverbs, there are two main themes in the book of Proverbs. One is wisdom, and one is money. My son, forget not my law, this is verse 1, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Those are three different things. Length of days, long life, and peace. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet or the stone tablet of your heart. Etch it into stone in your heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. You want favor with God and man. Now, he opens that chapter by saying, forget not my law. Pay attention to what I'm saying to you, son. He hasn't said the thing yet. He's getting ready to say the thing. He's sitting his son down and saying, pay attention to what I'm about to say. Take this to heart. Etch it in stone on your heart because it'll give you long life, peace, and favor with God. Then he begins to say the thing that he wants his son to learn. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Your knowledge should not be what you depend or rely upon. In everything you do, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge God in everything that you do. In everything I do, I acknowledge God. What does the word acknowledge mean? What does it mean to acknowledge God in all thy ways? What it means is, whether I'm cooking breakfast, whether I'm working on something at work, I have to pick which work I'm talking about. I'm a very busy man. Or whether I'm spending time with my wife, whatever I'm doing, I'm bringing God in for his position on what I'm doing or getting ready to do. Lord, I want to give this 10 seconds for your voice to speak to me about what I'm getting ready to do. What should I do, Lord? That's a, that's a habit that you should develop. I bring God in on everything. If I feel like I'm doing something I can't ask the Lord about, I'm not going to do that thing. I don't care what it is. Everything I do, I want to be able to involve God in and feel like God will have something to say to me about it. Why? In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he, and he shall direct your paths. Your paths, meaning whatever you're getting ready to do, you want him to direct it. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. In the beginning of Proverbs, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's a theme that's brought up time and time again, is that it is our understanding that God is the ultimate goal, that is the first piece of knowledge you must attain to. That no matter what you attain other, 
It is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning and the end of all knowledge. It should increase our understanding, our reverence, and our relationship with God. If you make money, it should bring you closer to God, not farther. If you have a relationship, whether it's friendship, marriage, children, whatever, it should in some way or another be bringing you into closer fellowship with God because that is the beginning of all knowledge. Okay? So you will hear fear the Lord a lot. And if you, whenever he says fear the Lord, he's referring back to when he says the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. You are a fool if you don't fear God. You can have a PhD in multiple disciplines. You can have 40 years experience in any craft. But if you don't fear the Lord, you are a fool. All knowledge begins with the fear of the Lord. And this is what, this is the wisest and richest man on earth advising his son. This is a man who's famous today for his wealth and his wisdom. And he's been dead for 5,000 years. You might want to pay attention to what he's saying. And what he's saying is, everything I know begins with the fear of the Lord. He's giving his son a secret to knowing everything. People have accused me of thinking I know everything. I know I don't know everything. But I know the one who does. It shall be health to your navel or to your, to your innermost parts and marrow to thy bones. Now we talk about money a little bit. Honor the Lord. This is verse 9 of chapter 3. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Everything you bring in, honor the Lord with the first part of it. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And we honor God with the first part of everything we bring in. It honors God to surrender your substance to him. He's laying down a foundation to his son. He says, look, if you live this way, you will live long and you will be wealthy. We haven't even gotten to the New Testament yet. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Why? So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Watch this. He's telling the boy, specifically, you will have a lot of resources if you honor the Lord with your substance. Then he says this. He warns him. He says, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Neither be weary of his correction. Why? He says, the Lord will have to correct you. He will have to discipline you at times. He says, never get tired of that. Never get weary of the Lord disciplining you. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Why? For whom the Lord loves, he correcteth. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. So the more God loves you, the more God will correct you. Because correction is him directing your path. So I begin my journey acknowledging God in all things. Then I honor God with my finances. I honor him with my substance. And the return on that honor is correction and him controlling my path. So that my barns, make sure I quote it right, so that my barns will be filled with plenty and my presses burst forth with new wine. Okay? Solomon is connecting two things, wisdom and finances. Now, of the two, Solomon is emphasizing wisdom, not 
finances. Got a couple of bullet points if you want to write these down, and I think you should. It would be very wise if you did so that I don't have to keep repeating them. But I will read them a couple of times if necessary. The prosperity culture, since we're talking about creating a culture of prosperity, the prosperity culture considers physical wealth a product, not a pursuit. If I have one rebuke for some preachers, not all, and not many of the ones that you're thinking of, if I have a rebuke for some preachers is this. When they start preaching about money, they start preaching about money. And they shouldn't preach about money. We don't preach about money any more than you would preach about dirt. You preach about wisdom. Because wisdom breeds wealth. And I'm going to show it to you. Just in case you don't believe me. Because I want you to believe me. Go to Proverbs chapter 14. We're going to spend a lot of time in Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. It was one of my favorites as a child, and it still is to this day. Proverbs chapter 14. You know, I spent a lot of time in the book of Proverbs as a child. My parents insisted upon it. And I have a, a little bit of a favoritism towards the book. That and Psalms. Proverbs chapter 14. Verse 24, the crown of the wise is their riches. The crown of the wise is their riches. Now, what does a crown do? A crown signifies status. You walk into a room, you see somebody wearing a crown, you realize something is special about that person. You walk into a room and you see a person wearing a crown, and you immediately point out that person's wearing a crown. They must be in a position of authority. They must be a person of great power. They're a king, they're a queen. Crowns matter. The crown of wisdom is riches. And that's in your Bible. I didn't make that up. There is a degree of wisdom to which one can attain where that wisdom is rewarded with riches. And what has happened is some theologian, I don't know who, decided that since wisdom is more valuable than money, money has no value at all. It's all about wisdom. But that's not really what the scripture is saying. What the scripture is actually saying is money without wisdom is destructive. But wisdom manifested until it's a crown will breed money. You're not supposed to be wise and broke. Now, Pastor Dana preached on that on Sunday. And I was going to assume that she was stealing from my notes again. Because I was hoping she would avoid that, that particular chapter. Not really. But there you go. Yet again, we did not converse. I didn't know she was going there, but she went right there about the poor man's wisdom. So that's one less scripture I got to read. That was nice. That was nice of her. Wisdom breeds wealth. So here's the question. If you are not walking in wealth, where are you deficient in wisdom? A lot of times we think it's a money deficiency. It isn't. It's a wisdom deficiency. Now, wisdom can be manifest in many forms. One of the ways that wisdom is manifest in the book of Proverbs is work. I've never met 
a generation of people so averse to good old-fashioned work, but so desirous of wealth. We are always looking for a way. You know, I enjoy passive income. Passive income is great. However, you cannot be passive and build passive income. You have to be very active for a season until passive income becomes a result. We live in a society where everybody's trying to figure out, I'm going to buy this thing, and it's going to be worth this much in 10 years, or worth this much in a year. Everybody's trying to invest. Everybody's buying Bitcoin. Everybody's buying this. Everybody's trying to figure out, how can I go from zero to a million? But they're not asking, how can I work? The job market has never been this good. And what I mean by that is, there's a lot of jobs. Unemployment is incredibly high. If you really want to work, you can get about three jobs per person right now. I've never met so many people in an economy where unemployment is so high. Avoid working. But see, it's a culture. It's cultural. Nobody thinks they have to work. And when you stop thinking that work is an essential part of wealth building, when you start thinking that there's a trick, there's a back door, there's a technique, you'll give your wealth to a fool who will sell you a book. And the only advice in the book is write a book about how to get rich. <laughs> it works for about the first two people, and everybody else gets scammed. Because work is wisdom, especially if you don't have any money. The fastest path to money, if you have none, is work. That's wisdom for you. Take that to heart. The fastest path to money, if you have none, is work. If you have some and want more, work more. There, I saw a lot of problems right there. Now, I didn't say toil. I said work. And work is different. We're going to talk about that a little bit, too. Here's another point for you. The prosperity culture promotes wisdom as the highest gain and relishes the reward of wise counsel. I'll say that again. The prosperity culture promotes wisdom as gain, as the highest gain, I'm sorry, and relishes the reward of wise counsel. That reward being wealth. You know, if you exercise to lose weight, you'll never lose it. I've never met a person who worked out to lose weight that actually accomplished that goal. If you exercise to lose weight, you will fail. I learned that the hard way. I spent two years, my wife and I, bouncing from one gym to the other, trying to lose weight. And my wife, in all of her wisdom, said, honey, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> she said, well, she was even nicer than that. She didn't say we. She said I. She said, honey, I don't know what I'm doing. She said, and you can keep doing what you want. She said, but I want to start getting results at some point. She said, so I want you to buy me a trainer. I said, well, you got the revelation. You pay for it. But, <laughs> you know, she said, I want you to find me a trainer and hire him. I said, okay, baby. And when we first had that conversation, I was like, well, I don't need no trainer. Because I know what I'm doing. Because I used to have a trainer. About 10 years ago, I had one. He was good. And I was getting results. I was getting results. I was looking good. I was feeling good. I was dropping pounds. And then I went broke. I had to fire him. And then I got married. And uh, I got money again. Then I got married. Let me put that right. Uh, but then I never rehired him. But I kept remembering everything he had taught me. So I felt like I knew what I was doing. But I wasn't losing any weight. I was gaining weight. And I couldn't figure out why, because I knew I was going to the gym. But she said, babe, we've been doing it for two years. It's not, something ain't working. She said, so hire me a trainer. I said, all right. So I went online, looked around a few people. There was one guy that was doing it out of his garage. I said, nope. I'm not sending you to some brother garage. <laughs> not about to do that. She said, well, I want a woman trainer. I said, well, you're going to get a woman trainer anyway. 
I don't care. No. I ain't got no abs. I'm not competing. No. <laughs> you gonna get a woman. You gonna get a woman. And that's 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 off the table right there. So, <laughs> so uh, I said, well, you know what? I'm, I said, that's wisdom. See, that's wisdom. You know, not that I was worried about my wife, but you know, these brothers anyway. Uh, so I said, well, I'm gonna just go back to where I started. So we went back. I said, I want to train them for my wife. So the guy gives us a tour the gym and all that stuff. And as they're showing us the stuff, I hear in my spirit, you need this too. Because <laughs> I was literally telling the, the guy that was giving us the tour, I said, yeah, this is for my wife. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm pretty good. I'll probably get a membership here because y'all got some good equipment. But I don't really need this. Now, two years in, I ain't lost no weight. But I know what I'm doing. So the Holy Spirit says, both of y'all need it. I said, I ain't got the money for this. Trainers aren't cheap. Good ones aren't. I said, I ain't got the money for this. I said, I can, I can cover her. I said, but I got to do my own thing because that's going to keep money in my pocket. He said, both of you need this. Do it. So I signed the contract and all that stuff and gave him the credit card and put the stuff on file and this, that, and the third. And uh, we were doing the math. We probably spent about $8,000 a year between training and supplements and gym memberships. And we ain't missed a, a, a session yet. I said, Lord, who, it ain't cheap to be in shape, y'all. Now, I've lost 40 pounds since then. So it's working. But I was doing the math. I was like, good Lord, this ain't cheap. <laughs> My wife's fault. You know what I could have did with that kind of money? I could have bought all the Oreos I wanted. <laughs> but the Lord gave me this revelation. He said, you're going to spend money on your body someday. He said, you're either going to spend it in the gym or you're going to spend it in the hospital. He said, your body is a very expensive thing. It will cost you a ton of money one day or the other. He said, if you save all that money not going to the gym and not having a trainer and not eating the right food and not doing what you need to do, it's going to come back as hospital bills. It's going to be three times as high. He said, so you might as well get used to it because it's expensive to be healthy. It's not too expensive, but it does have a cost. Now, that's what, that was what we had to do. Everybody got their own path, but I promise you this, you're going to invest in your body at some point in your life, because them organs is going to give out if you don't take care of them, and an organ is expensive. Ask my mama about my daddy. <laughs> organs are expensive to keep alive. It is not a cheap endeavor, and hospitals know it, and they know that when you're laying on that bed, they can take any dollar they want from you, you will pay it, and they charge you $80 for a Tylenol. $60 for an Advil, and you'll pay it. So anyway, I said that to say this. When we started, we was trying to lose weight. We got this trainer, and she's about my mama height. She's about this high. You can put any human you want in there. I just use a point of reference of someone that I admire greatly. <laughs> I'm working my way out. She's not a large person. She's strong for her size. She's very strong. She's very fit. But I was like, she can't teach me nothing. Because my last trainer was a military, he was a, he was a strength, and strength and conditioning coach for Norfolk State football team. He was Army Ranger. He was, I was like, that's the kind of trainer I need. But I told my wife, I said, you're going to have a lady. And she said, well, I can do both of you. I said, OK, we'll see what happens. You don't know how to. That's stupid. That was dumb. Because she kicked 40 pounds off of me like nobody's business. And here's the thing. She would talk to us about how she eats, which I never paid attention to before. I never cared about diet. I had already convinced myself that, look, I can run an hour. I can lift whatever weight you put in front of me. I'm not going to stop eating ice cream. I'm going to eat Oreos. I'm going to eat Doritos. I'm, I don't count calories. It's too much work. I don't track macros. It's too much work. I'm not going to do it. So just work me harder. If I got to spend two hours in here every day, I can do that. I'm not putting these chips down. But she began to explain that it's 70% diet. She was like, you'll never lose the weight if you don't eat right. 
She's like, I can't work you that long because your, your body stops gaining after a while any results, and then you're just sweating for no reason. She said, but if you eat this way, she said, we're going we're gonna to measure your body fat and all of your measurements and all this stuff. I'm going to work out a, eating, a meal plan for you, and you're going to start meal prepping. You're going to make all your meals on Monday. You're going to put them in little containers, and you're going to eat that twice a day, every day, until next Monday. And you're going to know how many calories it is. You're going to know how much fat it is. You're going to know how much, how much protein it is, how many carbohydrates it is. And this is your life now. This is your life. We've been doing that two years. Is it two years? Yeah, 2020. So yeah, almost two years. It is my life now. And when I step on the scale, the numbers are just going down. What changed? Here's what I learned. She was changing our culture. She was not interested in weight loss. She did not try to train us to lose weight. When, I, when we first showed up, that was all we had on our mind. I'm too big, I want to be less big. But <laughs> simple, right? But in her mind, she was like, eat like me. You come into the gym as many days as I come into the gym. You work out the way I work out, and you eat like me, and then just go live your life. And now she got us buying all these supplements, you know, protein and creatine and all these other teas, because that's how she eats. That's what she does, and they're not cheap, you know. But because the Lord told me to do it, he's provided every dollar for it. I don't work for it. It barely touches my budget. Don't ask me how it happens. I know how it happens. He's paying for it because he told me to do it, and I'm obedient. And when I did the math and I saw how much money per year we was putting out, I said, Lord, I didn't think I could afford this. But now my culture requires it. I cannot go back to the way I was eating. I used to eat a whole pizza by myself. We order two large pizzas. I eat one. She eat half of one. She can't eat as much as I can. But I put a whole large pizza down by myself on a Friday night. I can probably get through two slices. Three, if I haven't eaten much the rest of the day. If I know I'm going to have pizza, I'll eat a light breakfast, a light lunch, have a protein shake, and then have pizza for dinner. When I used to eat normal, and then have a whole pizza at night. <laughs> and what's funny is when I remember my old culture, I try to figure out how did I do that? How was I living like that? But I won't live it. I was dying slowly with a lot of grease <laughs> on my mouth. <laughs> culture change brought wealth. We needed the trainer because even though I knew what she knew, I thought I knew what she knew because I had had experience before, her culture is different than ours. And we needed to draw on her grace to live her culture. It's her culture that brought about the change. Weight loss, strength, muscle gain, all that good stuff is the byproduct of that culture. It's not the goal. Now, it was our goal when we started, but now our goal is different. Now our goal are measurable results. You know, we'll, every month she tests our fitness to see our progress. It's not based on how much we weigh anymore. Now it's based on how much can you lift, or how fast can you run, or how long can you run. Now it's about fitness. It's not about weight loss anymore. Because it's a lifestyle of fitness. So we can test your fitness regardless of what the scale says. And what seems to be happening is when you get on the scale, the numbers go down. But she doesn't pay attention to the number on the scale because that's not the culture. The culture doesn't say, oh, you weigh this much, you need to fix that. The culture says, you can only do 20 push-ups when you get tired. Let's work for 30. That's how she thinks. And that's how she taught us to think. That's wisdom. And the reward of that wisdom is the wealth of fitness. Does that make sense? That's how financial wealth is gained. You reprioritize 
the wisdom of God. And the reward is wealth. You don't prioritize, how do I get more money? If that's your question, you're going to spin in circles, picking up little tidbits of information from a bunch of different people and trying to piece it together into a lifestyle. And this is what Solomon is telling his son in the book of Proverbs. He says, look, at the beginning, fear the Lord. The first three chapters of Proverbs is all about how important wisdom is, what wisdom is saying and why, what to avoid to stay in, to stay in a place of wisdom. Because wisdom is the core of a prosperity culture, not money. When you preach prosperity, you preach wisdom, and prosperity will come. The Bible says that. I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. Come on, phone. Okay, I got a few minutes left. Let me give you one more nugget. Write this down if you're taking notes, and you should be. A wise thing to do is take notes. I'm a teacher. I like when my students take notes because you remember things you write down, and you're going to want to go back and study these points. So if you're not a note taker, get used to taking notes. I know we record everything, but it's something, it's something that engages you in the class better if you're taking notes. I learned that from my mama. But dad did it too, but mom was better at it. Sorry, dad. You can only produce what your culture will allow. You can only produce what your culture will allow. You are not the product of your abilities, your desires, or even your efforts, but your culture. You are not the product of your abilities, your desire, or your effort. You are the product of your culture. And everybody's culture might be different. But I can tell your culture by what you've produced. And when I talk to people that complain about one issue or the other, I look into the culture of their day to day. Your culture is made up of a lot of things, what you believe, how you speak, what you listen to, what you eat, what you do the most, what you do first. The first thing you do in the day is part of your culture. The last thing you do at the end of the day is your culture. Your opinions on one issue or the other is attached directly to your personal culture. And your personal culture is responsible for how you turn out. You are the product of your culture. If you look at your life and you see something that you'd rather be different, find out what is your culture and why does your culture allow for that. See, I've got a culture in my home that doesn't allow for poverty. I don't allow poverty in my culture. If it appears there's going to be a financial deficit because we have an enemy, I don't have financial deficit in my culture. What I have is opportunity for increase. So I give opportunity to God to increase every time it looks like there's going to be a deficit. That whole gym thing was one of those things. Because it looked like I couldn't afford it. But, I, but instead, I gave God an opportunity for increase. And God increased us. And here's the thing. We're doing more now than we were when we started. And we haven't missed a beat. And it's not because I'm so smart or my wife is so smart. And we are. We're very smart people. You get to know us, you'll get smarter. But it's not because of that. It's not because we're so good looking. We are. She definitely is. But it's not because of that. It's because I don't have a poverty culture. You will never hear me say, I can't afford that. You will hear me say, I'm going to see what the Lord wants me to do about that. If the Lord wants me to do that, I can afford it. 
If he doesn't, I can have a billion dollars in the bank. I still can't afford it because it's not about money. See, I don't determine what I can and can't afford by how much money I have. I determine what I can and can't afford by how much of God's wisdom I have about it. And that was good. If you didn't get nothing else, you need to get that. I don't determine what I can and can't afford by how much money I have. I determine what I can and can't afford by how much of God's wisdom I have about it. If I have God's wisdom about it, I can afford it. If I don't, I can't afford it. Even if I had the money to pay for it. Because that's, right. that's not what I, my culture is not based on finances. It's based on wisdom. It used to be based on finances, and I never had enough. But when I switched to Solomon's method, when I switched to Solomon's method, my finances changed. And they continue to change. And yours will, too. We're going through this together. So we're going to go over some familiar territory and mine out some things that we may not have seen before or seen in a long time. And we're going to tread into some unfamiliar territory as well. But I want to drive this point home. This is not about money. It's about prosperity. And prosperity is a byproduct of wisdom. Your homework is Proverbs chapter 3. And let me give you a couple more places that you can just peruse at your leisure. Proverbs 15, 6. One of my favorite quotes. In the house of the righteous is much treasure. I love that one. That's good. Proverbs 14, verse 24. A crown of wisdom is... Hold on. I wrote down my note and not the scripture. Proverbs 14, 24. I want to try to say it right so that they don't get me. The crown of the wise is their riches. And if you just read through the book of Proverbs, we're going to be in there for a little while, so you can get ahead, you can get a jump start on that. I recommend chapters one through five as a main point of study, but those other couple of scriptures are just good to reiterate the point I'm making. In closing, I don't know what Pastor Daniel's got planned for Sunday, but I got a good feeling about it. I hope I didn't use any of your scriptures. Not yet. Okay, good. I hope I didn't, but even if I did, it ain't but so many in the Bible. You know, I wish I had a monopoly on them, but I don't. And look, as she preaches, I'm over there taking notes. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to do something with that on Wednesday. That's why I'm glad I get Wednesdays, because I get to get her first, and then I can kind of punch up what I'm going to preach about. So I've been using Pastor Diane. <laughs> but that's what, that's what she's there for. That's what she's there for. That's what... Every pastor got to have a pastor, and that's why. This ain't coming out of a vacuum. She got a pastor, too. And she learned from Pastor Phil and Pastor Barbara. She got, a, she got pastors, too. Supposed to. Did you learn anything this evening? Amen. All right. Let's go home. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your righteousness. We thank you that you've made us your righteousness, and we thank you that your Holy Spirit is the seal of that righteousness in our lives. Father, you are a prosperous God. You are a God of prosperity. I don't care what the critics say. I don't care what the naysayers say. They don't know you. We know you. And we can't find anything in you that endorses poverty. So we won't endorse it. We won't follow it. And we won't allow it in our culture. But we thank you for teaching us, training us, raising us up, and building us up by your grace and your grace alone for that very purpose. And as we leave this place with never your presence, Lord, we are reminded of your promise in Psalms 91 that you have given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways and they bear us up in their hand. So we thank you for divine protection from all hurt, harm, danger, injury, death, damage, sickness, disease, and any work of the evil one until we come again together on Sunday, Lord, to worship, praise, tithe, give, and be fed the uncompromised word of truth. We receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.